And I thank everyone who has donated to me in the past. You're the only reason that I'm able to stay as independent and as free as I am. Um, but you're probably tired of hearing about that by now. I'm tired of talking about it. Uh, so for the next hour, you're going to hear me talk about something, something I haven't spoken of in a long time because I've been bogged down in, in um, political things. Um, but that's not what this show is, was, was initially about. And I go back and forth on this all the time. Um, some of you may have heard that um, E. Michael Jones has a new book out um, on Logos, which is the Greek word for word with a capital W, not just words as in words on a page, but the structure of thought. And he's one of my favorite authors who I've known for a long time. And um, it's a book that's typical of him. It's a thousand pages. I think the introduction is a thousand pages or something like that. So um, it's not a beginner's book, but it's one I recommend. I haven't, I haven't gone through the entire thing yet. The section on Hegel, I'm iffy about, but otherwise, um, it's a, it's a great book. Michael's one of those guys who, when I was in grad school, took a, um, realized I wasn't alone when I started reading him. And not only just I wasn't alone, but there were other academics who had been, uh, removed from positions and everything else based on, um, uh, based on purely, uh, philosophical, not even ideological concerns, philosophical concerns. So, Logos and Saints Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory the Theologian, um, two of the major names in the patristic era. Um, and the tragedy is that unless you're Orthodox, you've never heard of them before, although Christianity is largely based on them. Um, the intellectual background of the church, what everyone else takes for granted, comes from people who are completely um, uh, esoteric to the... to. Not, not everyone can read these guys. You have to know Plato and Aristotle to read these guys. You have to know what the word logos means, for one thing. But these are some of the men who put the books of the Bible together. The Bible is not the ultimate authority of the church. The church created the Bible. The Bible is just a, a list of initially 74 books. The Protestants have taken book after book out. Uh, even the Catholics have taken two out. Um, the 72 versus 74. But these are the men who put the intellectual background of the church together that everyone simply takes for granted and doesn't understand. Um, Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory the Theologian are roughly in the same era, um, but even 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 those writing on on the patristic era, the Church Fathers, don't have any background in the history of metaphysics. Um, the combination of both the knowledge of theology and the knowledge of metaphysics sometimes isn't it's it, it's it's relatively rare. So, but those writing on metaphysics don't often see the patristic writings as legitimate continuations of Plato or even metaph metaphysical systems at all, even though they're metaphysicians in their own right. Now, the section I'm going to deal with here comes from uh, my book that I've been working on for a very long time, which may never get done, um, The Ontology of Death, Patristic Philosophy Against Promethean Nominalism, which is supposed to be my magnum opus. I've actually dealt with chapters from this book before. These are still relatively rough, but um, I'm the first to come up with the idea that well, not come up with the idea, but, but to explain the idea that nominalism is the root evil. Modernism, liberalism, anything else uh, comes from nominalist ideology. Um, but their opponents, the realists, believe in forms. Most of you know what a form is, form with a capital F. These are archetypes. They're reality with a capital R, reality in the strict sense, which is what the name realist comes from. The problem is because material things are always in flux, not to mention our human perceptions pick up only a tiny little bit of what's out there, there can't be any knowledge based on them. Forms have to exist for there to be any knowledge whatsoever. So the external world is extremely weak. Um, sense perceptions are very weak. And forms have to, have to exist in order for there to be any knowledge at all. Forms, of course, are, after St. Augustine, in the mind of God, and, and which is what Logos is. They're collected in the second person of the Trinity. But so I think Gregory writes this. He says, this is from his... Um, Life of Moses, in chapter 2, he says, None of those things which are apprehended by sense perception and contemplated by the understanding really subsists, but the transcendent essence and cause of the universe on which everything depends alone subsists. For even if the understanding looks upon any of these existing things, reason observes in absolutely none of them the self-sufficiency by which they could exist without participating in true being, as being with a capital B. On the other hand, that which is always the same, neither increasing nor diminishing, immutable to all change, whether the better or worse, for it's far removed from the inferior and has no superior, standing in need of nothing else, alone desirable, participated in, but all but not lessened by their participation. This is truly real being, and the apprehension of it is knowledge. So, 
Gregory of Nyssa was more of a poet than a metaphysician in a strict sense, but he was one of a long line of Greek Platonists who saw Christ inherent, or I should say intimated, in, um, in Platonic thinking, especially the realism of Plato and Plotinus. But the use of Neoplatonic metaphysics is to solve Plato's problem and how the Greeks in the Orthodox world solved the problem, how forms can be brought into the experience in the daily purview of the average person, uh, the average person back then. But when Plato died, that was his greatest problem in his system. If the forms were the source of goodness in nature, then the remoteness from human experience is a gaping hole in the theory. Plato was a prophet, in, so to speak, in the sense he was given insight into the structure of the world that could only be made complete by Christ's revelation as the I Am. He refers to himself as I Am several times, which of course is a translation of Yahweh. When he told the Jews that he, before before Moses was I Am, I Am was referring to himself as Yahweh. Most people miss this part, even though he refers to himself as God in that particular statement, and that's why they pick up the rocks to kill him. Um, but Gregory's metaphysics is based on the symposium. Plato's symposium, in the sense that all earthly pleasures lead to the ple- lead to that pleasures that, that don't fade. If there are specific pleasures, then there's one that is ultimate, a pleasure that's not mixed with pain, which, of course, can only be God himself. Those reading St. Augustine would can understand this. All earthly loves imply that love with a capital, capital L, the origin of love's form that unifies and defines all of them. The grace that is God's presence on earth and his church is the manifestation, the hypostasis, so to speak, of the form of beauty and love accessible to men who need only believe and the Trinity and all that it implies. If there is a specific instance of love, then there has to be an ultimate love, or else the word doesn't make any sense. Um, the opposite of a definition is a spectrum, and a spectrum is the only thing that nominalists could ever come up with. But the ascent of the mind from specific things to the most general things, which is central to the patristic vision in general, requires that intellect and the passions be not, well, the, the passions be um, transfigured rather than repressed. Now, the ascent is a, is a standard concept in ascetic philosophy, and it just remains the absolute center of everything. The ascent implies that man lives in a nominal world, one populated by individual sensibles, or individual things, that are not, and can never be the object of knowledge, only a provocation. They provoke the passions, not the intellect. But the ascent is to leave that world, the world of physical sensibles, and grow in spirit and mind to apprehend in some limited way the, the forms themselves, which is another way of saying logos, but in pieces rather than entirely. Well, the word passion um, gets used a lot. Some people think it means just enthusiasm, but it's far more significant than that. It, it's, it's a problem only in the sense that it assumes that nominalism is true, that only the physical, individual, sensible is real, that the only things that are real are individual things, which, of course, is nonsense. The sensible thing, the individual thing, doesn't impress the mind in any kind of a rational way, but it does provoke the passions. It demands its acquisition and domination. The object is perceived as a means as a means to an end, as far as bodily pleasure is concerned. It's not a bad thing, necessarily, but it is an incomplete one. The objects that exist imply one that exists internally. Eternally, sorry. We naturally desire delight and satisfaction, but only those things that don't go away. Our limited pleasures necessarily imply much greater. But that's the transfiguration of the mind's power through actual constitution of perceived objects. It forces the earthbound mind upwards to the world of forms, Truth with a capital T, that doesn't change. If it, if it changes, it isn't truth. But the nominalist world of individuals is false. It changes, and more importantly, can never be the essential cause of, of knowledge. The only thing it could cause is a passionate response. These beings, these things exist as expressions of reason and logic. If logic and reason are things added to the sensible world, like the nominalist has to claim, then there's no a priori reason to assume that this logic is not utterly foreign to the objects of the world. Reason has to be not just internal to us, it also has to be out there. Otherwise, logic is just simply imposed on something totally alien to it. Logic, in the point of view, presupposes that it's a human creation that exists to work on sensible objects, and is foreign to them. The Enlightenment, the modern world, is based on that idea, that logic is not inherent in nature outside of us, and therefore has to be imposed violently on it. Um, but that which is particular is understood that way because of the organization of social life. Now, I mentioned that, that I didn't like his, his section on Hegel so much, so I haven't been through it in any great detail yet. And he doesn't get into the uh, metaphysics of the matter, which is probably a good thing for most, most of us. But our apprehension of form socially, um, but the, the organization of the social world is prior to any speculation about reality. Social life, social life produces a vague consensus that is then imposed on the world of sensation. 
So modernity, speaking generally, stresses the Cartesian self, which is an arbitrary abstraction from the whole. And the social community is conspicuously left out. If you notice, from uh, Descartes onward, um, up until well, up until Hegel, the social world is completely left out of uh, epistemology. But even the general will of Rousseau is an abstraction without any inherent content. But this is one of the central steps in grasping any kind of rational defense of medieval metaphysical realism. The human consciousness is agency and purpose in the same way that unity of the Trinity is its power. Agency comes first. Will comes first. So someone like Nikolai Berdyaev, his existentialism, God's freedom pre-exists the creation of matter. Will and consciousness are one and the same thing, and in a very real way, exists in potential before being applied to any action. The Trinity is based on the rejection of nominalism, since a nominalist can make no sense out of three persons of an identical uh, substance at the same time. Nominalist epistemology can't grasp the existence of any kind of universal, uh, the highest universal, generating two additional persons who remain fully persons, while of the same essence. So, the world of the Trinity is a social whole, but it excludes the concept of individualism uh, in favor of the most concrete of all universals, unified by a common purpose and power. The relations of the Trinity are significant as the persons themselves. The relations are just as significant as anything else. Love, a mutual ontology that unifies the persons in their separateness. But that's not entirely foreign to our social life. To separate the individual from the social whole that created them in the first place is arbitrary, and it's factually false. But it's logically false. There's no possibility of the individual without the whole. The individual is a product of the whole, whose reason is generated through the socialization and education that the social community provides in the first place. In other words, individualism is false because in the process of defending it, you have to use collective uh, logic and language and, and arguments that you've heard elsewhere. So even in defending individualism, it's immediately rejected. So only through ideological special pleading is the individual, the isolated individual, taken as, as paramount. So Gregory writes, this is poetic in this sense, his commentary on ecclesiastes. He says, the universe contains everything, and its harmony does not admit the dissolution of created beings. Instead, we have conquered between them all. Neither is the universe severed from many of its parts. Instead, he who truly exists holds all things by his power. God is indeed true existence or absolute goodness. Also, any name we ascribe to him points his unutterable reality in section 406. So it's unutterable in the same sense that Spinoza's substance is unutterable. It contains in and of itself infinite content, or as far as we're concerned, infinite content. Logos is a very primal manifestation of infinite content given logical form and structure. This is why the essence of Logos can't be understood by the limited human intellect. It assumes familiarity with infinite content, something which is beyond our abilities. While we can grasp the presence of this law and structure in natural and social forms, this is Logos only in its limited and very partial manifestation. So St. Gregory in this passage stresses the con concept of conquered between all forms of the cosmos. Logos serves as the essence, in Aristotle's sense, of objects in the cosmos, including the whole itself, as well as the relations among objects, systems, and subsystems of the whole. The whole, therefore, becomes an object, though not of cognition. This is the partial manifestation of Logos presented to us. So Gregory's Platonism is shown by the phrase, does not admit of the dissolution of created beings. The point here is that the forms of objects don't disappear. Their manifestations in the world of sense come and go, but the eternal archetype of Logos remains. Power in this passage is used identically as St. Gregory Palamas will explain many years later. The power that holds all the cosmos together as a whole is the light of God. Light meaning energies, grace, power. They're, they're, they're synonymous. All one and the same object. Light is therefore metaphysical. It's a metaphysical concept that refers to the grace of God via Logos, sustaining the cosmos as a single thing, as a law-bound entity. You can't have science without law. You can't have science without regularity. You can't have science without logos. You can't have science with nominalism, hence the notion of industrialization as some alien force imposed on a nature that's not prepared to, to, to serve it. But the broader point is that this grace is personal. It's the presence of logos, the second person in the Trinity of God. The structure is not a dead scientific law, but it is a person. He says this on, on the Psalms. He says, if the entire world, the entire world order is a kind of musical harmony, whose artisan and creator is God, as the apostle says, then man is a microcosm, an imitator of him who made the world. The divine plan for the world sees this image in what is small, for the part is indeed the same as the whole. Similarly, a piece of small transparent stone reflects like a mirror the entire sun, in the same way a small object reflects God's light. I say in the microcosm, man's nature, all the music of the universe, it's analogously seen in the whole through the particular inasmuch as the whole is contained in the particular. The structure of our body's organs follows the same example, for nature has skillfully constructed it to produce music. The difference between the person um, 
The social hold in God is highly fluid. Now, there's no strict boundaries here. Boundaries exist because human beings are fragile and fallible and limited. The whole is the only object of knowledge. But human beings can only begin, begin from the immediate and relatively false report of the senses. The Trinity remains both the first church and the first society, where individuals find their place only within the whole. They become individuals only in the secondary sense, that the whole and its functions have created them and endued them with the pro proper moral vision and function at all. The whole creates the part, it's whole with a capital W, creates the part in the sense that the part only makes sense when considered as part of the whole. But the modern world, modernity, is based on destroying the whole and as a moral result, enthroning the greed of acquisition as the primal, base, and purposeful element of human life. It becomes its own end, in other words. These realizations are the ancient foundation of realist thinking, both metaphysically and socially. And those two fields, as I've said many times before, are highly integrated and related. And the distorted thinking of modern metaphysicians is based around the complete separation of these various branches of the same reality. Today, the philosophical establishment has much to answer for, with large salaries and light teaching loads, unmatched by any real contribution to actual understanding. Now, when I first started writing this, Analytical philosophy tried to justify itself as somehow the inferior handmaiden to what they think science is. Serious philosophy is being done only outside of the universities. There can't be any separation between the assumption of nominalist ideas and the analytic desire to serve as a retainer uh, of the scientific elite. But ethics, social life, theology, ontology are the same thing. They use different vocabularies in approaching the identical subject matter, but from different methodological starting points. There's no metaphysics apart from social life, since our, our associations create metaphysical speculation in the first place. Realism assumes that social communities are the only basis of social life, but nominalism assumes that the individual is. The argument for both is ultimately a social one. The separation of metaphysics from social life is arbitrary, and of course the result of academic bureaucratic thinking, rather than actual reality. Now the social whole and our place in it is set down by the functionality of the Trinity, which is, people don't realize this is not a um, truly academic matter. The realization of the Trinity doesn't necessarily come from, doesn't normally come from a fallen universe, although St. Augustine may disagree with this, but it requires personal purification and transformation in order to be seen clearly in its effects, of course, never in its essence. So the incarnation, which is continued, so to speak, by the sacraments, is the bringing to earth of the forms of Plato in their true sense, via Logos. The forms now make sense in that they are collected, so to speak, in Logos a sense where the sinful and fallen man can grasp the purpose and structure of the form without having recourse necessarily to abstract philosophy. Plato was metaphysically correct, and his vision went as far as unaided human reason can go. Christ's presence is a means of rectifying normal human error in these central matters. But Plato laid out the foundation, and of course the church filled in the many blanks. But any good realist would realize that Logos theology is a presence of the imminent forms in nature, it's not to say that they're not independent forms, that form of divinity present in the church, but human senses see the form as imminent before they see it as transcendent. Nevertheless, even fallen humanity can dimly see the wisdom present in the natural world. Again, that's wisdom with a capital W. To make sense out of this, you have to have proper doctrine. Realism versus nominalism, a debate which was alive in Plato's time, lay the first real debate over the nature of reality. The spiritual world can't be nominal, almost by definition, and that the spirit is by its very structure of form. The spiritual world cannot be sought after in a, in, a, in, a, in a lustful sense, because it isn't physical in the first place. The centrality of nominalism in modern society is identical with the unleashing of the passions of domination. Nominalism is the source of moral error. And again, St. Gregory says this, even the inquiry as to the thing uh, in the flesh itself which assumes all the corporeal qualities has not been pursued to any definite result. For if anyone has made a mental analysis of that which is seen in its component parts and having stripped the object of its qualities, has attempted to consider it by itself, I fail to see what will be left to investigation. For when you take from a body its color, its shape, its hardest weight, quantity, position, its forces, active or passive, its relation to other objects, what remains that still can be called a body, we can either see of ourselves, not taught by it by scripture. Wherefore also, the elements of this world, we know only so much that our senses are able to receive, but they severally supply us for our living. We possess no knowledge of their substance. And that's from, uh, against uh, Eunomius. And the purification of the mind, will, and senses is a prelude to being able to experience the grace of the resurrection to see logos and wisdom clearly in the natural world. And I, logos and wisdom are synonymous in, in most cases. The sacramental life is a small glimpse of this, since it is a natural world set aright. The presence of wisdom, logos, and purpose, which are all one thing, become clear, even or especially, to simpler minds who don't really have access to philosophy in the first place. 
the nominalist understanding of abstract objects, really abstract qualities, disappears as logos, the imminent form of truth in things, it becomes clearer. Specific qualities, while part of the world's beauty, become radically secondary to their final and formal cause. Qualities are illusions, born of falseness and mental dispersion. Of course, they have a place, but they're radically secondary to the actual truth of the objects they point to. Qualities are symbols in the true sense. They're not objects in and of themselves, but they do point to reality with a capital R. So our knowledge of matter is only the knowledge of, of individual things, the only things considered to exist in the modern mind. Matter, though, does contain, contain so to speak, spiritual qualities um, as weight or texture, but albeit quantitative ideas. All matter is, as far as the human mind is concerned, the collection of quality. So in that sense, anomalists are correct, except this is not the end of the story. Um, Scovarada, for example, writes, the mere quality of appearance is the very definition of matter. Getting behind appearance, stripping it away, is the entire purpose of philosophy in the first place. Reality is one of the most unreal elements of the modern mind. Reality is that which does not appear, but generates appearance. It's wisdom in, in the Old Testament sense. Logos, as the forms present in nature, or rather the form of the good or wisdom, you can see this in Genesis, where the Logos, where the Word of the Father, becomes manifest in the specific sense of natural objects, or natural systems that generate individuals, a secondary elements of themselves. Systems are created, systems that are manifestations of wisdom. Objects might be the most obvious ingredient of the system, but they exist only because the system exists first, the Logos exists first. Creation is self-contained through the presence of wisdom. It is self-regulating and mutually reinforcing, and therefore natural laws... That's the active presence of Logos, is inherent in his nature's operation. So in his work against fate, um, which was directly against the, the Greek idea, uh, the pagan Greek idea, uh, Gregory of Nyssa says, We may perceive the divine nature in every good thought and name manifested in our lives, such as light, truth, righteousness, wisdom, incorruptibility, and any other good we can comprehend. We recognize the divine nature and its attributes by all those things which are opposite to it. For example, death instead of life deceit instead of truth, and every type of evil uh, inimical to man. All this means is that reality is what the modern man believes is not real. Reality is wisdom, logos, while appearance is generated by it. Now, if human beings were sinless, wisdom would come first. That would be the first thing perceived. Qualities would serve as a decorative outer coating, so to speak. That's how law can actually be beautiful. It's the essence of the Platonic system in both the statesman and the symposium. But in simple terms, Objects taken in isolation make no sense. Systems and the system of systems, which is wisdom, alone is the object of human knowledge. This is as far as the human mind can penetrate into the divine essence. Individual objects in the anomalous mind can only go as far as to produce natural reason and logic. The human will, uh, reason and logic itself, themselves, uh, and the body are productions of the earth and its natural processes. They can produce nothing but expressions of themselves. To claim that matter is all there is can only be an example of circular reasoning. If the earth produces human beings and their logic, then implied there is the idea that earthly things alone can be understood. It doesn't imply materialism, but it's both the result of both passion, intellectual laziness, and a corporate conformity you found in modern thinking. As Gregory states regularly, the human mind is not satisfied with the acquisition of the world and its earthly products. It desires more. It desires, uh, uh, this desire strongly implies the existence of a spiritual world that alone can make sense out of the free will. Logos, as you saw in the Stoics, can be seen in nature, however, very dimly. Man is possessed of spirit that is freedom, can produce Christ in the sense that Christ was capable of taking human flesh under the mask of a singular person. I should say humanity can produce. Say that the human nature, uh, human form, can, under the proper conditions, produce a theotokos that can contain, so to speak, the presence of the divine fire. When considered rightly, the earth finds its proper place as a domain of the spirit. The individual, while important, also finds its place as secondary to the forms, the whole, the communities of the, of the natural world. The final end is the total destruction of dualism. Matter becomes spiritualized while spirit takes on redeemed matter. Wisdom becomes the primary quality in matter, rather than a secondary quality, as is seen by us, by fallen man, dictated to only by earthly material desires. Reflecting on these desires, however, can't come from matter, since matter can only recognize itself. Now, some of you may note here that there is a lot of Vladimir Solovyev in this, and that's not an accident. Solovyev is one of these people who, um, at least in his metaphysics, if nothing else, um, made sense to me out of uh, not just Logos doctrine and some of the Church Fathers, but even Hegel, who he was massively um, influenced by. Um, 
But matter is capable of creating individuals. Like the scholastics later, St. Gregory holds that matter is known primarily as a principle of individuation. But that's the same thing as appearing. Spirit can be created by matter, as the occultists of the Renaissance try to claim, but the reverse is true. It can't be created by matter. Matter is created by spirit for its own purposes. The ideal becomes real under the form of matter as a family becomes one in form of a household. Thinking of the family as a singular unit is not the result of material processing. It's the result of wisdom inherent in matter that creates law where there is, in, where there is chaos. Law must come first, matter second. The reverse simply doesn't make any logical sense. Now, St. Gregory sets up his ontological poetry so the final purpose of his writings can be made manifest, to grasp, to grasp in a sense, the ascent of the human mind from the nominalist individual to the platonic form, given its true shape through the incarnation. So, nominalism produces the dispersal of thoughts into eventual chaos and schizophrenia. Form is more real than matter, but it's largely inaccessible except by the truly gifted, such as people like Plato, the prophets, Marcus Aurelius, and the Church Fathers, of course. Grace, the presence of the Spirit, which is one and the same thing, is required both to lift the mind to heaven as well as recognize the forms as truly real. In fact, grace is even necessary to implant the desire to rise above the muck of individuals and materialism. It's easy to live in the determined void uh, world of matter. When I say determined, I mean simple cause and effect without freedom. It's hard to rise above it or even realize that you can rise above it. But the empirical reality still holds. Men have done this. How and why is the matter for philosophy, of course, not science. Now, two conflicting things. You have two conflicting things about the human mind here. It's a schism. It's the result of, of the fall. First, that the mind at its most ideal seek pleasures in truth that are beyond the present material world of individuals arbitrarily classed under genre and species. The latter seem distant and for the nominalist really non-existent. The second is that the mind, though in some second order sense, desire to see the forms, to go beyond the material individual, the human mind is habituated to like an animal living in the world of the passions, which is precisely the desire for the material individual things of the world to dominate them. This is the hoarding desire of fallen man, whereby things like governments and possessions and armies and bureaucracies and factories and other idols are collected in the frantic desire for security. But they can't give security. It's natural in the fallen sense for, human mind, for the human mind to accept nominalism is true. It derives from the passions, not reason. It's because individual things are amenable to ownership, control, and destruction. Only when the mind is freed from this commodity fetish can man soar beyond the individual to the form or the foundation of the individual, which is what the form is. Once the modern world made factory life and the control over nature its main reason for existence, nominalism became its official ideology since that mentality cannot even conceive of a form which gives shape and purpose to the natural world. The modern mentality claims that nature has no purpose precisely so the elite can give it purpose. Modernity can be reduced to that single proposition. If nature contains as its essence wisdom, then man becomes secondary. Our purpose then is to discover and enjoy it, and nothing more. Nominalism, in assuming that nature has no purpose, then gives the elite its ideological justification to control it. This domination is the giving purpose to nature. In other words, claiming that nature has no end is to give the elite permission to create it and recreate nature as they see fit. That's the very nature of industrialization. So in St. Gregory's work, in The Mind's Ascent, his philosophical concern is to refute nominalism in the practical sense, that individual objects in space-time are illusions. They're phantasms created by man's passion to dominate and to hoard. But that can be taken too far, as I think Berdeyev does on occasion. With the scriptures, particularly the books of wisdom, or the wisdom books as a, as a whole, dealing explicitly with logos present in the world, as well as the liturgical poetry and the readings are essential, but insufficient for the mind's ascent from unreality to reality. Unreality is the nominal world, the world of appearance. They're twofold accompaniment. So you have labels and then corresponding emotions. The world of nominal realities, these, these things, these individuals that we're told exist, is the false world of labels masquerading as reality. And the term masquerade is essential because it denotes the words and labels so dear to nominalism as mere masks, revealing far less than they hide. Modernity's error is to take the mask as the real. The entire modern philosophy of language is pre predicated on that error. In the church, too, the ascent is made in symbolic form. The nave of the church itself is the fallen world, the cave, the veil of tears, in and from which we struggle against the passions for the sake of achieving reality. The icon screen, of course, is not a barrier, but an entryway from appearances to reality via the icons. 
Finally, the altar area is divine darkness, symbolized in the Old Testament by the Holy of Holies. Therefore, the church is a manifestation of the forms of wisdom present in the world. It's the only actual scientific reality in the world for that very reason. Symbols are not unreal. They're entryways into what's actually real. Man's desire for possessions demand that the unreal be taken as real. The elite, factory owners, and the scientific establishment then decide what reality is. But the forms aren't the end of it. They're the penultimate stop to the divine darkness. Forms are the expression of divinely purged, of the divinely, divinity purged of all nominal appearances. Forms are the entryway to God, not God himself. While the forms are externalized wisdom which Logo synthesizes wholly, the origin of the form is the divine darkness. God the Father. God the Father is not rational. He is beyond form, reason, and logic. He is the origin of the order within which human logic and language make sense. The structure of reality or wisdom implies the further creator. To avoid an, an infinite regress, God the Father, beyond all rational description, save what is revealed through wisdom, is the final origin of all order and the order of order. The presence that must exist to make, the, make that order of eternal formal reality make sense at all, or to exist at all. So from his great catechism, he says, For although this last form of God's presence among us is not the same as that former presence, still his existence among us equally, both then and now, is evidence. How he rules and is in order whole together, that nature and being, then he was transfused into our nature, in order that our nature might be trans, uh, might by this transfusion by the, uh, by, of the divine, become itself divine, being rescued from death and put beyond the reach of tyranny of the adversary. For his return from death becomes to our mortal race the commencement of our return to a mortal life. So the common element is the vision of order and created things. As mankind degenerates, his reason is more and more effaced, and it becomes now a uh, mere rationalization. Nominalism exists in part to remove any language that might be used to express any kind of universal truth in the world. Once that's taken as an axiom, then reason has no use except as a means to gain the object of the passion. But like everyone in the patristic era, there is no distinction between the spiritual and emotional state on the one hand and our perception of the external world on the other. The external world, in other words, is perceived in part according to our internal state, this central postulate of patristic philosophy must be rejected by modern academic philosophy because it would eliminate most professional philosophers from ever uh, doing anything, philosophizing at all. The point is to stress that perception doesn't account for the outside world. It accounts as much for our internal state as anything else. So, but God the Father is distinct from matter in the sense that God is one. He's unity. Matter is not. Matter is dual. It's dual because of the very nature of creation itself. God, as it says, pours himself out into, into creation, as, as the slogan goes. The Logos is found in everything. But matter is dual because it's material, but contains the Logos, its purpose or place in all creation. It is known not through itself, but only in relation to all around it. So metaphysics centers around the spiritual state of the knower. And then Gregory calls philosophy a speculative aestheticism. That can only be accomplished when the knower has been purified. But Plato recognized this too. At the same time, speculation can't be separated from daily practice. There's no specialized philosophers that are well paid for their efforts. Practice and daily life can never be separated from the daily fare of philosophy. There's not a specialized academic philosophical vocabulary that can be quickly dispensed with when getting back to the real world. Philosophy is about purification when considered in speculation, while asceticism is about the actual world of purification. Philosophy has only, only has its purpose in self-mastery, to grasp the inner self and its purpose in the world. But as St. Augustine would say, or at least would not be opposed to say, we come to some indirect knowledge of God and his activity. The body seen as flesh and motion acts as if it is self-sufficient. It pretends that it's that material things are all it needs. Only when one goes inward can that emptiness be seen. It's the soul and the will that need co uh, completion. Our passions are the platonic unlimited, while our ascetic endeavors are the limit that is placed upon them. The nominal world, the world that is arbitrarily divided into things, objects or sensibles, and groups of them, is normal. It's mediocre. It's the common possession of the ignorant. Objects aren't real, and that they've been set off from each other. It's an arbitrary setting, uh, arbitrary setting off having more to do with custom than reality, but it forms the very basis of nominalist ontology. What counts as an object? The individual is always changing. Ecosystems are considered as individual as a fern without it, or the fern within it, or any object within it. But it does no harm to the doctrine considered common sense by those who are saturated and drowning in the modern world. And the philosopher is the only free man because only he can grasp the fact that the objects of this world are not objects of knowledge. They're objects of desire, first and foremost. They're as unstable as the desire for them is. The sensibles of modernist ontology can take on reality only when they become an aspect of the regime, the recreation of matter in the interest of the oligarchy. Individuals are only individuals when they are manipulated for the sake of those with the power 
to, to so manipulate. Now this, anyway, I'm sorry for the background noise and all of this. Um, I'm not in my in my office. I'm uh, I'm on the road. I have the feeling that you'll live though, um, and uh, you could still you could still understand me. Um, anyway, um, the point is that individual objects aren't objects of knowledge. They're only objects of desire. Um, and they're unstable, as desires are unstable. But individual things only take on reality when they become an aspect of the ruling class, the recreation of matter in the interest of the oligarchy. Individuals are only individuals, and they're manipulated for the sake of those with power to so manipulate, as I've said many times in the past. But the very words that Christ used to describe his own relation to the Father are the groundwork of St. Gregory's view, or the realistic view, unmistakably metaphysical, in as in, I am in the Father, are terms used to describe the church and its own relationship. Um, but members of the Trinity are in one another. Each contains the other two. The Trinity itself is the middle ground. The idea, the idea of reality in itself, to use Hegelian terms, but the Trinity is the middle ground between that, what became Islamic Unitarianism and some ever-changing pagan polytheism. But metaphysics itself forbade Gregory and his peers from seeing God as a mere unit. He's a community. His very power assumes and implies that he's creative since his very thought is itself God. Since it's internal to the omniscient workings of God, his thought has to be God by definition. So simple reflection forbids the Unitarian concept of God to make any sense. St. Gregory rejects the filioque because the Father is the principle of unity, the generator that generates his own thought and action, which by definition must be God too, rather than simple, simple aspects of himself. So the Father serves as a core of reality since he is the ground of being. The I am, Yahweh then acts, then moves and thinks. He creates logos and the spirit from these actions. They're part of God, they come from him, yet a thought cannot be incomplete, nor can his action. They have to be God. There's no essential distinction between the thought and the mind that generates it. There's a distinction in hypostasis, or manifestation, but to separate them is to fall into the eternal nominalist error. Affection never sweet generis, nor is there meaning. Individuals make no sense unless seen as hypostases, or standing under the broader idea in the system. So, but when you reject nominalism, the social consequences end up being the doctrine of royal and patriarchal life. And paganism has to be democratic and material. Um, if you read Ovid and the stories of the gods show a democratic equality and independence from one another, and Logos doesn't have a will of its own. Only natures have wills. It serves the hypostasis of thought through the Father, and thus ha has to be God. But paganism from Babylonia to Rome is chaos. Each entity, is a pantheon, reflects the minds of who first wrote the poems and stories. Social life is anarchy, and only occasionally forced into shape by the transitory nature of superior force. But for the church, force doesn't make any sense. The ground of the relations are ontological. Nominalism only knows force, since force is the only thing that brings sensibles under one roof. All roofs, so to speak, are artificial and transitory. In the modern world, force is all that exists. So to grasp someone like Isaac Newton, you have to grasp the error of nominalism in the first place. The father is the ground of existence, the alpha and omega of all relationships. The father on earth is the king and patriarch. He's the ground of all familial relationships. The anomalous metaphysics that is adopted through political revolution, the father loses all purpose. Anarchy remains. But an anarchy that serves to invite the oligarchy to impose its own sense of hierarchy. One hierarchy is no better than another, and no moral distinctions can be made if meaning is not to be found among sensibles as such. The visible world exists solely through light. His presence is another way of speaking of this light, the power and grace that holds the cosmos together as a singular thing. But mental freedom is derived from this understanding. Um, but the study of Logos is known in part by the study of the complexity of the natural laws as they manifest themselves in everything everything from biochemistry to, to physics. Logos in himself, outside of the church and its revelation, is another matter, though. The fact that the world of matter is law-bound is something assumed by modern science, but the origins, purpose, and end of such law is beyond their abilities. So, idolatry comes from the attempt to make sense out of Logos as a mechanical entity. More dangerous problem is grasp, or there's a group of well-meaning amateurs, and some not so well-meaning, who try to work out their own psychological problems through disputation on these things, trying to pin down the actions of logos, both answer a need in some people to appear intelligent, but it also causes theology to become toxic. The human mind, encased in matter, is going beyond what it's capable of doing it on its own. So say those who try to peer into the divine darkness are those often without spiritual preparation. One of the most important assumptions or axioms of the modern idea, the view of ancient medieval science. Medieval science is derived directly from the science of Rome. Itself is based on the Greek. The assumption of the Enlightenment is historic. Science per se only existed in the modern world. The Middle Ages were a time of superstition. Natural laws were not known in this era. People died allegedly at 30, 
in the Middle Ages, and our longevity derives directly from the new sciences developed as a result of the Enlightenment. Those who criticize modern science, those who are criticizing from a rightist point of view, were smeared as appearances. But it's based on a series of myths anyway. It's a rewriting of history in, in, in a weak sense. It posits um, really ignorant, sick people liberated by the developing scientific method in Britain, the Netherlands, and France. This method was self-generating, desirous only of finding the truth in the midst of superstition. So truth, science, and reason are defined in modernity precisely as that which derives only from this method. It finds its end in the development of technology. The conclusion, though, that the Western world is far more rational today than it was a thousand years ago, that it must be far happier and healthier than it was a thousand years ago. But this approach bears very little resemblance to actual history. The main distinction between medieval and modern science is that the latter has its final purpose, the development of technological apparatus. Greek and Roman science generally did not have machines as their end. The question, therefore, becomes how to explain ancient science. The Enlightenment approach claims that there was no science at all in the ancient world, and hence no science in the medieval world. The latter is merely an outgrowth of Roman ideas. The reality that the ancients developed powerful empires, centralized bureaucracies, mathematics, uh, geometry, aesthetics, and astronomical precision and sophistication. Ancient medical science had a population living at roughly 70 years, the claim that the scientific world was the ancient world is unscientific, that the cathedral of Rheims was built by ignorant uh, craftsmen is to engage in just intellectual dishonesty. The precision of the ancient pyramids is alone equal to the most sophisticated building equipment of the 21st century, but no one denies that ancient science was very different from its modern inheritors. The difference lies in its product. Empirical and logical methods of inquiry were well developed in Egypt, Athens, Rome, and medieval Ireland. The Renaissance didn't resurrect Greek and Roman learning, nor did the Enlightenment recreate the nature of science and reason. Natural science existed in its empirical modes in the Roman Empire. The literature of Greece and Rome were the daily fare of medieval intellectuals. The concept of enlightenment is thus an occult concept. What was resurrected is not the empirical method of Roman poetry, but rather the ancient Babylonian occult science of alchemy. This makes the Greco-medieval scientific mind very different from its medieval, uh, from its modern successor. Um, anyway, I'm going to wrap this up now. At uh, I'm only at 15 minutes, but. Um, I have, uh, I'm going to do part two of this next week when I'm in a better position, um, and back in my office as, as normal. Um, but this is the, the fundament, fundamentals of the book, uh, that's going to be eventually finished one day on the nature of nominalism, the nature of logos. Um, E. Michael Jones's book is a far more practical and theological concern. Mine is more of a, um, a metaphysical concern, but it has to be done either way. Um, and then next time we're going to get into the uh, Kabbalah and, and, and uh, Isaac Laurie and the rest of them. So I've dealt with before, but never in, in any great detail. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. I've been saying for a long time, I've said it on this show, I've said it elsewhere, that when there is no such thing, and this is, you know, I, I said last week is going to be a part two to the um, the notion of, of um, um Nominalism, Gregory of Nyssa, and uh, the metaphysics of, of the church, and which precious few people are, are capable of dealing with. Uh, and this is what this is. This is a part two, but the foundation of all this, I mean, all philosophy comes from practical need, um, is the invention of reality. When you have the denial of universals, or that natural, uh, that objects have a, a natural purpose, that they you know, uh, objective definitions of things, when that's denied, then the only thing that's real is power. Uh, John Locke and Karl Marx said this, and that labor, and they use it very abstractly, takes nature which is hostile to man, which is classic Gnosticism, and uses force to pin down its powers in ways that are um, strictly utilitarian. That's what reality is. That's what definitions are. That's what objects are. And this is a foundation of uh, nominalism, and this is why nominalism is, and among many other reasons, the absolutely um, essential and official ideology of the Western world, and it's assumed. Um, therefore, that gives a foundation for simply inventing reality, because everything is the flux to begin with. So let me clarify a few things that I said uh, last week, because I know I spoke very quickly, and I went over some of the more, you know, the upper reaches of, of metaphysics. Um, over the centuries... I mean, even going back to the pre-Socratics, nominalism has been defined in a few ways. And one of the simplest is just to say that universals or eternal definitions of things don't exist. That in fact, there are no eternal realities, which is, which is assumed in the denial of universals. Most of you know of William of Ockham, um, in the late Middle Ages in Britain, who rejected the idea of the species of things. 
and reduces all that kind of categorization to the utilitarian application of words to the flux, the world that existed before language. There was nothing before language. Individual objects, the way we talk about them, anything from a tree to a, to a clump of ground, did not exist until someone forced language onto things. Therefore, there's no connection between language and the thing that's created because, you know, language is, is the creator. If that's true, then, le- then objects can be created at will. This is essential to, to modernism because, you know, Locke and, and, and Marx both make this uh, the absolutely central foundational uh, metaphysic of their, of their whole worldview. So, therefore, before language, you didn't have anything. You had a flux of qualities simply swirling around. And Nietzsche, of course, I believe this too. So a universal is something that, well, in the sense that Occam uses it, is something that can be predicated about many things. Many trees tree. But the predicate is just a word. It's just an abbreviation. It's an aid to communication. Using a word like tree to refer to these things that vaguely look like trees, um, that's a quick and easy means that we use to categorize reality. But that's the only way to, to reference anything and to communicate anything. But it's a shocking idea. You know, philosophy has done such a academic philosophy is, is useless. They've done an awful job of understanding this. You know, they they continue to play word games and reword the same thing over and over again. Um, what they don't seem to understand is is nominalism says that reality is, uh, or sorry, denies that reality is substantial. The real is the flux, the undefinable nothing. So human language is a means whereby the elite will forces itself on this flux. There is no nature until man creates it. Therefore, empiricism can't be true. So Marx saw this as labor's imprint on nature. But this is nominalism's ultimate conclusion. It's an attack on reality. Now, you have properties of weight and color, but what they adhere to is a single concrete object. So how that flux of properties and attributes gets the complex uh, notion of an object or a thing is that's that's the issue. Now, the universal, uh, the universal thing is a, is a platonic idea. Reality is made up of eternal entities that exist outside of space and time, and they only have vague analogs, uh, on Earth, which is largely chaotic. Law exists, but as man degenerates, it's seen as less and less real. Um, but both the, uh, well, the forms or the universals exist on their own and instantiated in, in things. Um, you know, trees versus tree. So in theological terms, it's the mind of Logos, using forms, in a manner of speaking, as a natural laws and boundaries between sorts of things. It's creation. You can't talk about creation without talking about forms. And discovering these is the purpose of science. Um, they, they may not even be instantiated individual objects, because God, containing all these things and all possibilities, seeks to manifest his greatness in what we call the cosmos. And Logos is the means whereby this is done. Forms are created. Logos is not. Now, William of Ockham defines individual, you know, meaning the opposite of universal. He uses three related conceptions, and I think I've dealt with these uh, some time ago. Um, the first is the object. Any object you see in front of you, it doesn't depend on anything else for its existence. That's the very definition here. There is no universal, so it is isolated. So the second concept is that it is isolated and doesn't refer to anything else, anything beyond it. It can't. It's ontologically independent and ultimately irrational. The individual thing is arbitrary, but it's the only way that we can communicate with the world. And finally, that the meaning of any object, any X, makes reference to other things, the concept of a definition, but these other things are conventional and therefore not real, at least they're not eternal. Now, Occam does believe in ideas or forms, but because they exist exclusively in God's mind, we can't know them. So mankind is severed from God. Reality exists in the divine mind, but the only thing that humanity is left with is accident and desire. Now, criticizing this is very difficult to do because we are born and raised, no matter what we are, politically or, or theologically, we're born and raised with nominalism. That the individual thing in front of us is the only object that exists. In social life, there's the individual, and everything else is accidental. But people like Alexa Losev, uh, who I've dealt with on this show many times, when he criticizes uh, nominalism, he connects it to social theory, that this is a direct result of a bourgeois urban culture where objects become products of consumption. They come and go. 
The only stable world is a conventional one, and that is money. Of course, is man's creation. Objects are mere phenomena. They're attachments to it. Um, well, money is the central... Even Karl Marx says this in, in his early writings, 1848, 1849, where um, the only stable measure of value is money. Everything else is abstract, because everything else exists only to the extent that it can be valued in financial terms. Um, but, but to know anything in Occam's nominalism is to accept the truth of something, um, given a usable definition and the use of the terms involved. It's purely subjective. So in any sentence that you may utter, terms have to exist in a context which connects them in some way. But these contexts um, aren't real. They're purely conventional. But Occam has no way to tell the difference. Um, Cyprian of Carthage says this, and he's talking about the church in this regard. As a mystical organism, the sacramental body of Christ, the church cannot be adequately described in canonical terms or categories alone. It is impossible to state or discern the true limits of the church simply by canonical signs or marks. In her sacramental, mysterious existence, the church surpasses canonical measurements. For that reason, a canonical cleavage does not immediately signify mystical impoverishment and desolation. That is a clear, and you know, most, most people, including most theologians and seminary professors, don't know how to read that idea, that passage that I just read to you. They don't know what he means by canonical terms or by, um, Canonical signs or marks. Of course, he's referring to words. He's referring to words both in the historical definition, uh, our present definition, and everything in between. Words don't mean the same then as now, but there is no way that the fullness of truth can ever be manifest in words. Words are too unstable. They're too weak. They conceal as much as they reveal. They are very poor vehicles for expressing the action of grace. When someone talks about the canons, they don't really mean the actual words and phrases. They mean much more than that. The words and phrases are a tiny part of the truth of the church. But this is a, a testament to our fallenness. Our doctrine is always incomplete because it's manifest in words. And the way we supplement that is through poetry, through art and music. That's why these things exist. Most of what we want to say, we can't say in words. It's too clumsy. So we have everything from um, every kind of art form, every kind of music, anything to supplement the idea that, that emotions and feelings are almost impossible to express in words. So music is, is an excellent substitute. Nothing can rival the experience of grace or love, but even there, it can only function on someone who has made themselves ready by both pure doctrine and a holy life. In something like romantic love, you know, people forget only a handful of people can really experience real love because love is complete vulnerability. It's saying, here is my heart or my center, my essence, in, in my personhood. I'm trusting you to not smash it, um, which is not necessarily a rational thing to do. But, you know, reason can only go so far because words only go so far here. How many people in today's world are capable of doing that? And it took me a long time to realize that really only a few people are capable of loving anybody. The minute you start adding conditions to love, that just becomes self-interest. I love you so long as it's convenient. Now, and this is a problem with you know, talking about law or, or canons or anything like that, and you know, being super literal about it, because you can you know, words only go so far. And then, of course, you have the patristic writings and, and the liturgical poetry. All of this requires a tremendous amount of historical and literary knowledge that, frankly, a handful of people have. Um, but William of Ockham, in opposition to this, says that universals are not things other than names. We talked about the so-called name worship uh, thing here, and I tried to explain to no avail that the very word name or word absolutely doesn't mean the same today as it did then. In the Middle Ages, it was far broader. The idea of a word or a name was the very interaction with the thing, knowledge of the thing. Uh, it's the thing's interaction with everybody else, everything else. It was a, a deep knowledge and understanding of a thing. It wasn't just Phil or Bill. I, I, I couldn't, you know, or tree. Right? No, that's, you know, and I, I couldn't, I failed to uh, to get this through to anybody. But if you believe that names are all that is, names in our modern sense, just labels, you know, tree, you know, man, you know, genius, soil, I mean, whatever, I, I don't care what it is. But if those words are the only things that exist, not what they refer to, then it takes away all inherent meaning to the natural order. 
It keeps natural, but it raises out order its own. So when the mind conceives of a universal, it's really only drawing its own internal picture of the archetypal aspect of the thing, one thing out of many. And it can't go any further than that. So when someone describes any object to you, they're not describing the object. They have a mental picture in their mind, and this is what they're trying to use very clumsy words to express. It's extremely difficult to get a handle on it uh, this way. It's the nature of language. Uh, especially in our modern world, it's conventional and therefore arbitrary. Words then, they don't do anything more than point to those mental pictures lots of people have about the same thing, to the extent we know it's the same thing. So then the only thing that's real is the manipulation of language, and the only people who could do that are the powerful. So for example, if I say that Socrates and Plato are both white, I can't say that they're white men. The nominalist ideology will forbid me saying that. The most I could say is, for general purposes, it's easy to agree that they both appear to be human and a vaguely similar skin tone. Beyond this, there's absolutely nothing. Occam's razor is something that, uh, like every every other concept in, in history, has been misunderstood, redefined, and turned into just a, a mindless slogan. It has never, under any circumstances, meant that the simplest answer is the right one or using fewer variables and an explanation is better than more variables. You actually have, you know, metaphysicians who will very pompously say that it's very important. You know, his, his great uh, contribution is to say that we shouldn't use more concepts and an explanation than we need to, as if that's some insight. Everyone knows that. We didn't need William for that. But the closest we get from Alcom himself in this regard is the phrase, plurality must never be posited without necessity. And he says this in the sentences uh, of Peter, his, his, his analysis of the sentences of Peter Lombard. Um, someone like Wittgenstein says in a Tractatus, he says, Occam's razor is, of course, not an arbitrary rule, nor one justified by practical success. It simply says that unnecessary elements and symbolism mean nothing. Signs which serve one purpose are logically equivalent. Signs that serve no purpose are logically meaningless. Um, but again, we don't need Wittgenstein for this. It's almost they, they almost seem unable to get to the root of the matter. But due to his errors, William of Ockham himself refused to believe God can be known rationally. Since no universal truth exists, there'd be no way of even approaching the question. And the scholastics, of course, said that this will simply lead to pure materialism. The individual is one of the most persistent myths of modernity. It's mythical because it's the creation of a life world that requires it. It's not false because of that, but because any definition of an individual has to be abstract. The individual is an arbitrary abstraction. You take one thing from a massive cosmos of being and say, this is real. The notion of individualism in, in sociology, of course, is absurd. Human beings are wildly dependent on everything and everybody. We don't spin our own clothes. We don't generate our own electricity. We don't deliver our own mail. We can't take care of our health directly. We don't build the homes we live in. We don't build the cars. Other people teach us how to drive them. We are totally dependent on others. And you have people who are dedicated to proving to the world that they're independent. I don't need anybody. And they end up working themselves into the ground, refusing to understand that even the very concept of claiming that I don't need anybody is a communal product. You know it, something is wrong that it's disproven by the very argument in its favor to Defend individualism, that the individual is the only real object, everything else is artificial. You need to use definitions and logic and thinking and language and everything else that exists independently of you. You didn't create any of that. So it, in the very act of defending it, it contradicts it. Nothing exists independently except God. Only God can be cognized through himself. The individual is an arbitrary abstraction. Um, but you know, even, even consciousness was different. People want to defend individualism because that's how we view the world. It's only us. It's our individual consciousness. And I say that's not true. The modern consciousness is a result of revolution. It's very circumspect. It takes into itself only the most narrow self-interest, seen abstractly. But that's the creation of modernity. It's not inherent in consciousness itself. Those born and raised in a tightly integrated community don't see themselves as an ego. They see the world collectively. They see them, the world as a community through one person. So even the most basic experience today has little relation to basic experience a thousand years ago. Um, 
Bertrand Russell um, went back and forth on the issue. And I mention him because he's a very unlikely ally. But he wrote substantially on the idea of nominalism and realism. An argument that he uses, um, he uses the example of geography. So he uses the phrase, uh, Edinburgh is north of London. And that fact is independent of our minds. It's a fact outside of time and space. To be north of is a permanent aspect of something. It's not in time, and yet all acts of perception involve something existing in a point in time. It is not an invention of our mind, it is not in space, and it's not in time. It remains an objective fact. Inherently, to be north of something um, is universal. Um, let me give you another example. Uh, one of the there, you know, There's good reason to believe that nominalism rules the West because it is the official ideology of atheism. Uh, H. Fields writes in 1980, and he's defending nominalism here, he says this, it says, nominalism saves us from having to believe in a large realm of entities which are very unlike the other entities we believe in, due, for instance, to their casual isolation from us, from everything that we experience, which give rise to substantial philosophical perplexities because of those differences. And, of course, he's referring to Occam's razor here. But decoding that turgid paragraph is relatively easy. He says, nominalism is irrational, but it's worth the price you have to pay for holding it in that it avoids questions of God, heaven, or freedom, among other things. So crudely put, he's worried that an anti-nominalist point of view will bring some people to think about the reality and superiority of the nonsensical world. If there's something is eternal and independent of our minds, or, a, I'm sorry, a truth independent of our minds, it has to be nonsensible. But for that to exist, for the so-called empirical scientists, that's intolerable. And, and people like Fields prove that that a positivist will throw the most sacred doctrine out the window, other than provide any reality to God or anything else that they can't control. The context of his argument is the reality of numbers existing outside of space and time. Without universals, you know, thinkers like, you know, Quine and Godel, Fields goes on to say that nothing in this monograph purports to be a positive argument for nominalism. So nominalism can't be defended but also that it's so obvious to them that it requires no other argument than the appeal to science of self-interest. In other words, if there's a realm of non-spatial, non-physical things, that means modern science can't control it. They have to adhere to it. It becomes a standard they have to follow. They then are constrained. That means metaphysics and religion would have their own space after all. But this is so overwhelming that Field says that there's no way he actually has to ar argue for it. He says to introduce this kind of... Well, the alternative to nominalism is introducing unjustifiable dogma, as he says, into scientific work. Um, and this is, this is the essential, this is the essential concept here that I've been talking about for, uh, well, most of my career. Um, I, um, so this book that you know, I've been working on for so long, I mean, years and years and years, of course it has a practical purpose. Um, one of the things I said last week, uh, concerned the Trinity. No Christian can be anomalous. That's, it's simply impossible. Because the social whole, the social life, and our place in it is in the pattern of the Trinity. The realization of the Trinity um, isn't necessarily something that we may normally experience for ourselves. St. Augustine disagrees, but, but because we live in a fallen universe and our mental powers are very circumscribed, it comes to us through personal purification and transformation. And we see the Trinity in its effects, but not its essence, of course. Um, Logos theology is is um, is the presence of imminent forms in nature. And I said that last week, but the form of the archetype has to be present in the individuals that it represents. Um, but human senses see archetypes as imminent before we see them as transcendent, as I said. So even the most fallen person can dimly see the wisdom present in the natural world. We could see that certain things are law-bound, certain things are regular, that there's laws governing the way things behave that never change. But by itself, it doesn't mean very much. The proper doctrine comes directly from that. This is a debate over the nature of reality. Um, and so many times I made the argument that nominalism and the individual, being claimed that the individual object is the only thing that exists, is connected with the passionate drives. The nominal entity isn't something that we can know. It's only something that we can dominate. The only way we come to know anything is through purification, because then we're able to see the regularity, the law-boundness in the world around us. Otherwise, 
we see things that we want or things that repel us either way because you know things that are repulsive still imply things that we want and the point of the church is to um, point to God's presence as this very same wisdom the sacramental life gives us a little glimpse of the the wisdom the logos the light as the energy they're all the same thing form present in the natural world including ourselves I said last week, and I've said it many times before, that logic is something to be trusted. Or I should say reason is something to be trusted, because reason isn't just something that we have in our minds. The um, Locke, Marxist, the whole, the whole modern um, secular worldview is that, of course, there is nothing but flux and reality, objects, words, or things are, you know, are created by powerful people. Um, reality is what the powerful make it. There is nothing... In the world that's natural, everything is conventional. We just call it natural. That's the that's the Enlightenment idea. Um, without any question, that's the Enlightenment idea is absolutely uh, is based on. It. But the nominalist understanding of abstract objects or abstract qualities disappears as logos, which is the imminent form, becomes clear. Um, but imminent forms, um, at least in the classical and medieval world, are called rational forms. Reason isn't just something that humans have. If you believe that we impose language and logical categories on the world in flux, and that's all it is, is flux, the will to power, um, then logic is the only thing that exists. It's something that's imposed on things. The realist point of view can understand that the very same categories of reason that exists in our mind recognize what exists outside of it. Logos is everywhere. Um... And this is why Plato connects the levels of the soul with levels of reality. The specific qualities um, of any object, they become very secondary to their final final cause. Qualities really are, are almost illusions. I think I said last week, qualities are illusions born of mental dispersion and a lack of integrity. Qualities do have a place, but they are secondary to the truth of the objects that they point to. Qualities are symbols. Um in the true sense of the word. They're not objects, but they point to them. The idea is that our knowledge of matter is only the knowledge of individual things, the only things considered to exist in the nominalist mind at all. Um, but this means that matter is just a collection of qualities. Um, qualities, of course, having no real purpose, and they don't really adhere to anything, um, and they certainly don't exist outside of our minds. You know, modern ideas of logic assume that the world is purely chaotic and we impose logical categories on it. And so the question arises, how do you know that our logical categories um, are actually out there in the world rather than simply something we impose on it? And of course, for the Enlightenment mind, it's easy to answer. Of course, they're imposed on it. They aren't out there. Nature is something constructed. And I mentioned, you know, Locke and Marx as two very obvious examples where you can say that the world is chaotic before humans become powerful enough to impose their will on it. Now, I don't know how human beings were prior to this power. Um, it would, you know, it's obviously an absurdity because they could, they could never survive it. Um, you know, you can't exist at all without civilization. There's never a time that man existed without civilization. Fallen man existed without civilization. Uh, you, could, you couldn't survive at all. And I've talked about this, the myth of the caveman and all that stuff. Uh, elsewhere. That means reality is one of the most unreal elements to the modern mind. Reality doesn't appear, but it generates appearance. In truth, of course, qualities derive from um, uh, what's real, the actual objects, not uh, inventions of the human mind. And I mentioned last week St. Gregory, he wrote uh, in Against Fate, um, and I, I, it, bears, it bears repeating because, again, I went through this very quickly said, um, he writes, We may perceive the divine nature in every good thought and name manifested in our lives, such as light, truth, righteousness, wisdom, incorruptibility, any other good we can comprehend. We recognize the divine nature and its attributes by all those things which are the opposite to it, for example, death instead of life, deceit instead of truth, and every type of evil inimical to man. What it means is, of course, well, that's the end of the quote, reality is what modern man believes is not real. What St. Gregory is saying here is reality is Logos, is the archetype. 
um, and appearances, what we, you know, what our senses pick up are that which is generated by it. And of course, it implies then that if human beings were sinless, it's the archetype would appear to us first, and then qualities would, would come secondarily. It's almost like a decorative outer coating. And as I said last week, that's how law can actually be beautiful. The forms, light, logos is present in never changing um, regularities in the natural world. Of course, that includes our own minds. Um, the very same law-bound status of objects outside of our mind exists internally to our mind. There's no difference. The mind is an object like everything else. There's no distinction there. We're born with the same um, qualities of, of, uh, of thought that exist outside of us. The assumption, the, the Gnostic assumption of modernity is that somehow um, the only thing outside of the natural flux is our brain, and therefore it imposes logical categories onto the world. So this is, you know, hopefully clarifies a little bit in what I was uh, talking about with St. Gregory um, last week. Um, and of course, the other concept I mentioned too was the idea of something being in. You know, I am in the Father. The Father and I are one. Um, you know, um, this is this is you know this is the absolute center of, of metaphysics. God is a community. Um, this is absolutely uh, essential. Um, but then I also mentioned last week that paganism, which of course really has no functional definition, but the world prior to um, Christ is inherently chaotic. Um, it's anarchistic. You know, force doesn't make any sense in the church, but force is the only thing that the pagan mind can comprehend. Nominalism only knows force, since force is the only thing that brings our perceptions under one roof. You know, we see a lot of things that kind of, you know, they're furry, they have four legs, so over time we call them cats. Well, there's really no such thing as cat. Was this an abbreviation for all those qualities that we see running around? So it's forcibly put under this concept of cat. It's not inherently that way. And Darwin believed the exact same thing. He does not believe in species. Um, but the only way to have any kind of functional knowledge is to believe in species. So the practical foundation here, and the reason why we do this, whether it be Trinitarianism or anything else, is the virtue. This set of habit, sets a set of habits that have us ascend from the brute object that we see in front of us to the archetype and then to God himself. You know, the brute givens, the objects that we see in front of us, the objects bearing the universal. Um, so we start off a life where the objects manipulate the passions, you know, our desires. And then the final end of that, we go from that to seeing God observed, observe God working through natural objects and the laws governing their interaction. Therefore, nature appears as love rather than violence. And that's what a virtue is. A virtue is that which makes that ascent all the easier. And the vice does the opposite. So a virtue is a structure of behavior, or a rule of life, so to speak, that permits the ascetic to ascend to God, in the sense that seeing the universal in the particular, or the spirit that's hidden under the colors and sounds of, of nature around it. Natural law, or the law as discoverable by science, is, is the mystic ascetic view. Uh, loving, it's the loving presence of God, directing his creation. For the, um, for the pagan, for the materialist, Law, whether civil or natural, is always an object of violence. It's nothing more than coercion and death, something set off, something alien from us, something we're forced to adhere to, not because, not because it's real, but because someone more powerful than us uh, has created it. So St. Gregory of Sinai writes about this. He says, fire, darkness, worm, hell correspond to passions, lusts of all kind the all-embracing darkness of ignorance, the unquenchable thirst for sensual pleasures, the stench of evil-smelling sin, which, like precursors and foretaste of the torment of hell, even now begin to torture sinners in whose souls they take root through long-established habit. So good acts, virtuous acts, are those that permit the ascent to truth. Christ as um, the summation of all of the archetypes. Logos, the ability to view nature this way. This is a sum total of the ascetic struggle. Bad act brings man back to the prison, brings him to the cave, and ultimately the worship of earthly power. The word passion implies patience. Um, patient in a sense of being like a patient and a doctor kind of patient. Something that's acted on rather than acts. Passion and action 
are opposites. Passion is the sort of the pull that objects um, have on the human will, forcing the will to act in one way over another, to be drawn one way, repelled to another. So the objects that we see around us are viewed only as means whereby a certain drive can be temporarily satisfied. And this is how the unredeemed view created nature. Because if the individual is the only thing that exists, and the individual is corresponding with the passions, then the entire nominalist universe is to satisfy desire. Therefore, it says more about the people who defend this view than the world that they want to describe. And I've said this many times before, but no one has ever gotten aroused by the concept of a woman. No one has ever been um, uh, uh, overcome with, with greed in an economics lecture. Though the minute you go above the individual, the pull of passion no longer exists. It's simply now something intellectual. The passions only exist when that thing is made purely individual. There's no knowledge there. This is why Plato connected these things. The passions on the one hand, the individual qualities on the, on the other. And at the very top, reason connects with the forms and the archetypes. And on top of that, of course, is what Plato didn't know. Is, of course, his logos, where all the archetypes are collected into one. That's the difference between a virtue and a vice. But nominalism is a basis for a life of sin, the life of the world, the people who dominate us. This is how reality can be created, simply invented, because there is no universal. Words mean whatever the powerful say they mean, because there's no connection between the word and any referent. It doesn't refer to anything at all. The word exists on its own, and the content of the word is provided by those with power. And you notice that we are not too far away from mental illness. Um, and mental illness to be found, among many other things, to look at an object. What do you think? Let's put it like this. All mental illness is delusion. There's no such thing as a mental illness that isn't based on delusion. The belief that something is there when it's not there. Uh, or vice versa. Um, but nominalism and the positivist and empirical mentality, uh, the empiricist mentality, um, uh, only, you know, can, can create, uh, words to refer to whatever they want. There's not anything out there for a word to adhere to. Words then take on a life of their own, and they could mean whatever those powerful enough to create these definitions want them to mean. There is no referent, and when a word has no referent, it means that words create reality. Um, so anyway, the, the repetition of virtuous action um, in their totality raise a human being out of this prison and into the the life of the Trinitarian life, which is what human beings were created for. That's what reason is. Freedom, properly defined, is a liberation of the will from this prison of cause and effect, of nature in its lowest form, and the repetition of bad acts in prisons, one in the earthly world of cause and effect, the very opposite. And so, you know, over time, it creates a habit one way or the other. So, and of course, it's connected with the idea of sin. Sin doesn't offend God in the normal sense of the term but it does offend against the dignity of his creation. Sin, therefore, is the gradual effacing of the true destiny of the human mind. It's a prison where the drives of the will are the only reality. And then that dissolves objects into the undulations of the will itself. Objects in space are the means whereby these are very temporarily satisfied. Sin is a prison. It imprisons man in the world of cause and effect, of force and coercion. If material is the only thing that exists, therefore force and coercion are the only things that exist. There's a big difference between community and a collective. Anomalists can only believe in the collective. A realist believes in a community. So something like penance, we refer to penance, is not making things up to God in any kind of juridical sense of compensation, but it's to take the penitent and put him on the right path, uh, on the virtuous path. It's training the will to not seek fulfillment in the world of violence and coercion, but the liberation that only the archetype can provide. So St. Macarius, uh, the great, um, or someone writing in his name, said, after a person had turned away from God's commandments and became subject to his condemnation, sin had enslaved him, and like a narrow and deep abyss of bitterness, having pervaded inside, captured the soul to its very deepest recesses. Likewise, we can compare the sin within us as a large and leafy tree whose roots stretch deep into the soil. Thus, having entered our soul, sin had overwhelmed it to its deepest recesses, becoming a habit that begins in our childhood 
and with the years grows ever stronger and leads us towards the vile. So asceticism liberates the will. It brings it above the world of cause and effect into the world of universal truth and reality. By definition, something is universal in that it's unchanging. If it's unchanging, it can't be material, because material objects are always changing. Universal truth and reality, the spirit, objects reflecting the will and love of the creator rather than a means of temporary fulfillment of our will. Now, the individual objects are never abandoned, of course, but they're radically transformed as the fullness of their being is revealed. This is the concept, uh, ethically speaking, of the idea of, of, of transfiguration. Christ did not create a new earth after his resurrection. That's later, that's at the second coming, when objects will be shown to us in their fullness. But God provided human beings who believe in him to receive the light, a light that will reveal the fullness of created nature, to reveal its universality. All of the promises that you see, you, know, you read the canons, Pascha and everything else, the concept of a new world, sin has been destroyed. Well, clearly, sin hasn't been destroyed. There is no new world. Things are worse than ever. No, what that means is that in the church, Eden has been reformed. The problem isn't the church. The problem is us. We, because we're entrapped in this prison, can't see paradise. We would have no idea what to do in paradise. We wouldn't know how to conceptualize it. We would eventually destroy it. So the church fathers all were heavily involved in the Platonic uh, debate. All the church fathers read Plato, Aristotle, um, and their students. So what it comes down to, the classical medieval point of view um, understood that nominalism sees only brute nature and force and coercion. Um, the Platonist wants to live among the world of forms, universal natures of things, things seen by the mind rather than by the senses. Um, and, you know, they, they went as far as they could without grace. But only the true ascetic later on was able to provide the content to the purely formal world of, of Plato's form. And this is where um, the life of the Orthodox saints is of philosophical value, seeing the visions, the attractions of wild animals, the ability to protect the future, uh, to see inside of a person. All of this is the heightened perception of the ascetic life, a life where the dead weight of objects is transfigured into the life of the universal, the form, the mind of God. And all the saints, I don't care whether it be everything from medieval Ireland to Egypt to Russia to Palestine, the life of the ascetic saint is identical in every case. Therefore, it can't be a coincidence. Through grace, he's able to transfigure nature and um, transfigure thought. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.